Today we have the opportunity of talking with a person who is known throughout North America and other foreign countries, not only because of the work that they're involved with here at their church in Highland, Indiana, but also because of some books that they have written. The first book is Battling the Hosts of Hell, The Diary of an Exorcist. Conquering the Hosts of Hell, An Open Triumph. Demolishing the Hosts of Hell, Every Christian's Job. And then a two-part series entitled Annihilating the Hosts of Hell, The Battle Royal, Parts 1 and 2. I'm talking about Pastor Wynn Worley. And on the set with me today is Brenda Miller McKillop. I'm Raymond Gail McKillop, and we're here to ask questions of Pastor Worley. Pastor, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. It's my pleasure. Let me ask you first uh, about your background. Before we get into the subject matter of your ministry and the books that you have written, what uh, is your background as far as ministry is concerned and possible education? Well, I'm, I am a Southern Baptist in background. I attended um, college at Southern Baptist College and graduated from East Texas Baptist College in Texas. And then <clears throat> I went on to Dallas Seminary for a year and a half and studied there. I've had quite a bit of graduate work, master's degree in other places. And um, I pastored for 35 years in Baptist churches. The, the thrust of your ministry that we're talking about today is deliverance. There's been a lot of talk about balance in people's ministry, uh, be it salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, divine healing, and now deliverance. What is your response to those and to this question uh, as to whether or not your ministry is indeed balanced? Well, this is a question that comes out very often. Uh, really, uh, I believe in balance. I certainly do. And fully one-third of Jesus' ministry was taken up with deliverance, and I don't think that you can be balanced without being in deliverance. We've been in it for 11 years now, and it's been the most rewarding and fruitful part of the ministry. At Hegwish, we certainly emphasize salvation and uh, people being saved by receiving Jesus Christ as personal Savior. We also are very concerned about people learning the Word of God, and so we teach the Word of God verse by verse, and we do teach a lot of things besides deliverance, although that's the thing that has been so unusual as to attract a lot of attention. And so uh, people get the idea sometimes when they read the books that, they are un that we are unbalanced because the books are exclusively almost about deliverance. And yet I've explained in the prefaces that this is extreme, uh, deliberate because this is the thrust of the book. What do you mean by deliverance? Deliverance is casting out evil spirits. We prefer the term over the secular term exorcism, although I'm not afraid of the term. Uh, semantics experts would quibble over it uh, as being a bad term and not in good taste. But um, exorcism to the ordinary person means throwing demons out, and that's exactly what we're doing. And it's a, the New Testament term is deliverance. We prefer this term, being delivered from evil spirits. There are, there are a lot of, or there is a lot of talk these days about good spirits and evil spirits and angels and witchcraft. Um, what is a demon? Well, a demon uh, is a disembodied angel, I believe. They are one third of the uh, host of heaven fell with Lucifer and the fallen angels, and as far as I understand, they became the demons. I know there are some other theories about where they came from, but uh, I find more biblical basis for believing they're angels. The ones that I've talked with all claim an angelic background and can't be shaken on that. Well, if there's only one-third of the heavenly host or the demons, these fallen angels, are there enough demons to go around? How can everybody <laughs> have one if there were only a limited number that fell? Or well, does everybody have one? <laughs> there's a limited number as far as being one-third of the heavenly host. However, when you realize there are multiplied millions and billions of angels, then you've still got plenty. There's no problem. There are plenty of demons to go around. Mm -hmm. yeah. who, who can have a demon? Uh, Brenda just mentioned, you know, are there enough to go around? But certainly uh, not everybody has demons. Um, what type of people uh, do you look for to have a demon? Well, I'm still looking for some that don't have them. So far, I haven't found any. <laughs> uh, we are wide open to the demonic attack because of our ignorance of God's Word. And God's Word and 
his truth and his protection is the only protection we have from these very vicious spirits. We pick them up by inheritance, we pick them up through curses, we pick them up through our own foolishness, dabbling with the occult and other areas such as this. And so every person has them, it's just not a matter of do you have them, it's how many and to what degree are they controlling you. You mentioned some things there, uh, uh, curses. Uh, generations, uh, demons being passed down. I mm -hmm. want to come back to that in a few moments, but are you then saying that Christians who are washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who have accepted Jesus as their personal Savior, uh, perhaps uh, speak in uh, an unknown tongue, referred to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, believe in the full gospel of the, of the Word of God, uh, the inerrant Word of God, are you saying then that uh, it's possible that those people could also have a demon? It's not only possible, it's just absolutely so. <laughs> we find them all over. As a matter of fact, about 99% of the people who seek help in the meetings, both here and across the country, are those who are Christians who are born again, definitely. But how can light and what fellowship do lightness and darkness have together? How can you have the Holy Spirit and an evil spirit both within the same person? Well, this question is asked over and over again. And you have to go back to the three-part nature of the believer. He's body, soul, and spirit. And if uh, it depends on what part of you got saved. When you were born again, certainly you were washed in the blood and made ready for heaven. But did your body get saved? I see your point. And then did your soul get saved? You see, your soul, again, is three parts. Mind, will, and emotions. And the mind, will, and emotions are certainly not up to par, they're under reconstruction, but they're not there yet. And then, so the only place that the Holy Spirit entered was in the spirit. This is borne out in the first chapter of Ephesians, the fourth chapter of Ephesians, and over in Corinthians, where it says that uh, we are sealed under the day of redemption by the, the promise of the Father, which was the Holy Spirit who came in. So you're saying then that these spirits, if we indeed have them, inhabit either like the physical, our bodies, where it, which causes mm -hmm. sickness perhaps? Would that be demonic or, uh, I mean, how, why didn't Jesus say, why did Jesus say lay hands on the sick and they shall recover instead of casting out the demons out of the sick? Well, I think you'll find that laying hands on the sick and praying for the sick and praying for healing is very closely related to deliverance because demonic forces are behind the sicknesses. They don't, they're not always very obvious. In some cases, they're very obviously in control. Other times, they're subtly behind the, string, the scenes pulling strings and making things happen. They uh, cause organs to malfunction, throwing strains on various organs of the body, which produce certain physical, mental, emotional reactions. But actually, uh, the demons are, are at the root of the thing. And How do you know that? Well, uh, one thing by, by pulling the demons out. When you pull the demons out and the thing is well, and the person is made well, then you know. I, I mean, it's pretty pretty good evidence. Isn't, isn't this a rather dangerous thing that, that you're talking about, uh, Christians talking about dealing with, uh, I hate to use the word handling, but, but certainly <laughs> uh, uh, talking to demons. Isn't that a, a rather dangerous uh, ground to be walking on? I keep hearing that all the time. And uh, the thing is, that Christians are so certain that they're safe in so many areas, and yet when it comes to conversing with a demon, they get all shook up, and even some of the leaders say, oh, you should never, never talk to a demon, never under any circumstances. But the thing is, uh, uh, no army captures prisoners of war and lets them go without interrogation. And that's what you're doing. You're interrogating. Well, how can you believe them? Aren't they liars? The father of life, Satan. <laughs> oh, they'll lie if they can. But like prisoners of war that are caught, you learn different techniques to question them and to make them tell the truth. And there are ways to do this. Well, one other thing I wanted to ask you, you were saying how the demons get into the people by curses. What exactly is a curse? And once you are a Christian and saved, maybe you could have be cursed before you were saved, but can you still be cursed afterward? What is a curse? Oh yes, curses are very much a, a part of our lives, whether we accept them, whether we believe in them or not. Of course, most Christians hide behind the verse in Proverbs that says, a curse shall not causeless come. Right. And that's right. Mm -hmm. But there's always a cause. And because of our ignorance of Scripture and our ignorance of taking advantage of the protection and the help that God has given us, 
we are wide open. For example, Deuteronomy 23, 2 and 3 talks about the bastard, the illegitimate child, being cursed to the 10th generation. Most people never even heard of that. And then uh, there are curses to the 3rd and 4th generation for dabbling with the occult. Well, can you be cursed now? How would I, or how would someone place a curse on me? What would they have to do? Well, witches could do it. Or there are various ways in which it can be done. Thirteenth um, chapter of Ezekiel discusses the witches casting curses on the righteous to make their souls fly, to fragment their soul, take away bits of their mind, will, and emotions. Well, is it just witchcraft, or is it also? Uh, we've heard so much in psychology. One thing or another about if you tell a child he's dumb or he's stupid or something like that, then they are clumsy. The child will indeed fulfill what you've said. Now, is that a form of a curse? Or yes, it, yes it takes, that actually takes the form of a curse. And I don't think it works exactly like the, psycholo the psychologist thinks. I've had some psychology also. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are accurate in saying the child will develop that way. But the reason is because that child has been um, caused to open up to a spirit that causes this kind of behavior. Well, you can say to a child, shame on you, shame on you. Well, a little child is very open to be molded and therefore uh, can be open to this. You can say, aren't you worried? Aren't you worried because of this? Aren't you worried because of that? Doesn't it bother you because your mother's sick? Does it bother you because your grades are not good? Aren't you worried? Aren't you worried? And we've, had, we've actually cast out spirits of worry and spirits of shame that, out of grown people who, that came into them when they were children because their parents constantly nag them about this. We have to be careful what we say. Pastor Worley, can't counseling take care of a lot of the things that, or maybe all of the things that, that you're referring to now? A child who is, is brought up in a family where he's uh, made fun of, mm -hmm. um, where he's told that he's stupid, where he's gotten bad grades <coughs> in, in grade school, maybe up through high school. Can't uh, that child be taken to a counselor, though, and be sat down and, and the same thing done without them being come and uh, coming to a service, uh, having hands laid on them, um, what you refer to as violent manifestations, uh, things like that? Mm -hmm. Can't a, a good psychologist accomplish the same thing? I wish they could. But we get people all the time who've been through psychotherapy, who've been through Christian counseling by experts. And counseling does do some good. Don't misunderstand, we're not n negating any uh, good that it can accomplish. But when a demon is deeply entrenched, it does not remove the cause. Uh, sometimes people are taught to cover up the problem. For instance, if you had a splinter in your finger, then, uh, and it began to be infected, you could bathe it, you could uh, put all kinds of medication, things like that on it. But until you remove the splinter, you're always going to have a problem with that area because the cause is there, the splinter. And when a demon is deeply embedded and strong, then you're always going to have those problems, even though you might teach the person to live with it, to uh, go around it by various uh, psychological maneuverings. But still, deep down inside, that problem is going to be there. And even the psychologist will say this. Sometimes you, you press down a problem here and it pops out over here in some other form. So that's not just a personality trait, then? You're saying that that is, is demonic it, influence? It is, a pers it is a personality trait, but it's caused demonically. And the demons many times are born in the people. You inherit them or they enter you shortly. Well, at the moment of conception, a child conceived in lust receives a heavy lust spirit. And therefore, that child is... is is born like that. And uh, he inherits that. And he always thinks of himself that way. I've always been this way. And a family trait or something, yes? How do you know that you have a demon? Or, or you know, how would you examine yourself and say, I do have a demon? Or that it's just a, a problem that you can resist by, uh, you know, following the word, reading the word, study, mm -hmm. and crucifying the flesh, that sort of thing? Well, if, the, if you are driven, harassed and tormented by this area, some area of your life, and you, um, this drives you into compulsive behavior that occurs with some regularity. may not pop out every week, every month, but it, uh, if, um, if it's regular, then uh, it's compulsive and it will tend to slow down, stop, or reverse your spiritual growth progress. Then you're dealing with a demonic trait and uh, this thing can be put in gear. Now, the devil made me do it is no excuse. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. I have a question about that then. All right, we, you know about deliverance, and you, you get deliverance for whatever area, but why still problems? Why do you still you have sick, sickness still in your church? Mm -hmm. People maybe that want to diet and they have a problem, they're still overweight. Mm -hmm. You know, why isn't you, can't you just cast out that demon of uh, lust for food or obesity or whatever or the spirit of infirmity and have that go? Isn't that what Jesus did? Once he cast it out, mm -hmm. it was gone and it was no more, and he just got rid of a whole lot of demons at one time. Well, I think he did a lot of things we haven't been able to do. Um, and that's not a cop-out, but uh, we are working on learning how to do this. And, and it's amazing in 11 years how much progress we've made. It takes us, doesn't take us nearly as long now to work on demons as it once did. And yet we're working, we're discovering new layers of demonic activity we never suspected before. And therefore, uh, we've got more ground to gain. We're, we're, a deliverance is an unfolding revelation from the Lord. It's, it's not a finished product. We're in the process of learning. We're certainly not experts at all. Would you say that you still have demons or problems with demons? Oh yeah, you sure, do. sure. I haven't been perfected yet. Some people have, but I haven't made it yet. Doesn't that scare you? Or why don't you just get rid of them? <laughs> well, it would be nice. We, we're, we're working on them. Let's put it that way. Well, is there any hope to get rid of them all? Well, I can't say I haven't been here that long yet, but we're working. We'll be still working on it. You, you are in, really in the process of learning. This, this sounds to me like it's a, a very involved thing. It's a spiritual warfare as opposed to a, uh, yes. a carnal warfare, and therefore you're blazing a, a path not only through the Scripture but through uh, actual experience. Well, you see, there are not any guideposts. When I got into this 11 years ago, there was only a couple of books on the market that were of any value. One was written, War on the Saints, by Jesse Penn Lewis out of the Welsh Revival. It came about in the late 1800s. And another was uh, Demon Experiences Many Lands by Moody Press, which was a little pocket book that had come out and been out for years and years. I got a hold of the first copy 35 years ago, I guess. So you can tell how old it was. It had been out a while then. And uh, there still are not a great many books of any value on deliverance because the, uh, the few that are out that are of any value, some of them have gone out of print. Others call themselves information books and they know nothing about what they're talking about. And uh, they have no practical experience to back them up with a, uh, no scriptural basis either. They just make a lot of wild generalizations. Why uh, has that happened? Why, why has deliverance not um, been more in the forefront, or maybe it has, maybe it's my ignorance that's showing here, but uh, for the most part, uh, as I understand it, why has it not been more prevalent in the church down through the, the, uh, the ages? Why have the books gone out of print? Why has this been, been quieted and hushed? Well, if, if, it's of, if it's of God. Yes. Well, it, it definitely has to be of God because it's tied directly into Jesus' ministry. You can't divorce it. But it is the area where the devil is unable to stop the believers and it has been squelched off. As a matter of fact, it has been at the forefront of many of the revival movements in the past. And study them, you'll find out when they started, they began to cast out demons. Demons began to manifest when the power of God fell. And they did begin to cast out demons, but they were uh, kind of taken away from it. They went away and they found a better way. The better way didn't cause as much commotion, you see. How do you cast out demons? In Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you confront them and call for them to manifest in Jesus' name and to come out in the name of Jesus and Christ. And what happens if they don't come out? Or if there's no manifestation, does that mean the person doesn't have a demon? No, no, because these things many times are hidden and have very, well, often they are shielded by the spirits. They've been there for many years and they, they kind of layer up and protect one another. Um, they're all gradations of demons. There are strong demons, weak demons, in between. And, um, but the believer has authority over all of them. But we, we haven't learned how to use our authority. They know how to use theirs. How do you know when you're talking to a demon uh, in deliverance? You say, out in the name of Jesus, um, and command them to manifest. How do you know that that's really a demon that you're talking to and it's not the person uh, simply uh, disagreeing with what you're saying? Well, uh, you'd almost have to be in deliverance and witness it to really see what it's like. We do have some tapes where the demons are talking, and people who've listened to the tapes many times who've never even seen deliverance happen are, are, are really convinced. 
because the voice is different, the whole thing is different, and actually they say and do the very same things they did in Jesus' day with a little bit more. How do they come out when you cast them out? How do you know it's gone? Or well, it would be sort of like asking, how would you know that an abscessed tooth was gone? If you'd walk the floor with it a couple of nights and it's just killing you, and you couldn't sleep, you couldn't rest, you couldn't find peace, and then all of a sudden you go to the dentist and he takes it out. Would you know it was gone? Yes. Yes, you definitely know. See, because, and the more tormenting the demon has been, the more the release will be in the person, and they themselves will know better than anyone else that thing is gone. What about the screaming and different manifestations and all that you do see when the uh, demons are they coming out? And when you actually pray for the people and the mass deliverance is all I've heard you say, now don't pray with your mouth, just breathe them out. Now, well, what is that? Well, that's because when the word demon is the same as the word spirit or breath, and most demons are going to come out through the breathing passages. Now they don't have to come out that way, but well, I'd say most of them do. And when they do, they, they don't like it. Some of them scream, some holler, some cough and choke and spit. And if you've gone through this, you know that it actually feels like your breathing passages are shut off when they come up because there's something in there. You can't see it, but it's a definite reality there. One more question. What about mass deliverances? Now, are they scriptural? Did Jesus have mass deliverances? We don't know about it if he did. Of course, you know, it says that if everything he did and said were written, you'd never be able to write books to contain it. Uh, whether he did or not, uh, they're very effective. A mass deliverance is merely multiplying what you would deal, do on a person-to-person -person basis. And you deal with the whole group as you would an individual and have them go through some renunciations, curse-breaking, taking authority, showing them how to do it, and doing it together polyparrot fashion and uh, it produces some amazingly good results. It doesn't do everything, but it, what it does helps. Earlier you mentioned uh, about a third of Jesus' ministry uh, being involved with, with deliverance. Uh, can, you, can you refresh uh, our minds as to uh, <coughs> some of those situations and, and what grounds you use for saying that, because uh, that's, uh, that's a lot of his ministry, yes. uh, and I'm sure people are, are wondering yeah. already of, well, what kind of computations are done to, to come up with a third of that. But was, was Jesus' ministry involved heavily with uh, oh, yes. deliverance? All you have to do is go through the Gospels and mark every time that Jesus was ministering, and it's amazing how many times it involved casting out evil spirits. And uh, you'll find that he, he evangelized, he gave the message, the message of salvation, the good news from the Father, and he cast out demons and he healed people. And in Mark 16, uh, where it talks about, in my name shall they cast out devils, those who believe, it was the first thing to follow evangelism, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, was of course the first thing. And then uh, the second thing was to cast out demons and then to heal the sick. And then he talked about the charismatic and the miraculous gifts working to enrich all the rest of that. But do you think he was referring to Christians when he was saying casting out demons, or was he talking about those people in, in uh, the book of Luke and then the Gospels that you had mentioned um, who were set free from, from demon activity in their life? Were, mm -hmm. they, were they believers or were they people uh, well, who, were, no, who just there, followed him? There's no reason to believe that all of them were unbelievers. Uh, the man in the synagogue, for example, was in the synagogue. He was a worshiper. And uh, if it follows the way we've seen demon activity work, he was probably unaware that anything was going to happen when he jumped up and shouted at Jesus that it was shocked him. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this type of thing happen where the person was stunned by what happened. They didn't even realize the thing was in them. Uh, the woman who's called a daughter of Abraham, who had been bent over with an infirmity, for all those years, and uh, she, uh, she's certainly a daughter of Abraham, that's the father of the faithful, she's identified with the believers, and yet she had been crippled for all these years with this infirmity uh, that he says definitely came from an evil spirit. So then there is no, there's no real documentation in the New Testament that would say that they were not believers? No, I don't think so. I think the burden of proof is on the people who say uh, that they aren't. I think they have to prove that they were not believers. Uh, of course, the anti-deliverance people always try to put it all on the deliverance people. And the, the strange thing is that most of the arguments that they put out 
are geared to the idea, well, you know, uh, you have to prove this and you have to prove that and you have to do this and you have to do that. But when you put it to other areas of ministry, they're not consistent. They don't require this of other ministries. For example, they, I've had people say, um, I hear you pray for people for deliverance. And I say, yes. Does everybody you pray for get delivered? And I say, well, no, not everyone. Most of the people. Aha! You know, and immediately they're all on guard. And I say, wait a minute now. Do you believe in evangelism and soul winning? Yes. I said, well, does everybody you pray for uh, accept, or, and witness to, do they receive the Lord? Well, no. Some of them do. I say, aha. But you see, they won't be, or, or does everybody you pray for for healing, do they get healed? And, and they say, no. But you see, they don't want to put the same yardstick on deliverance. They, they want absolute perfection when it comes to deliverance because they don't believe in deliverance. And that's a very poor way of arguing, you know, if you're not, you've got to be consistent. Why is there, and, and I want to move off the deliverance uh, area in just a moment, but let me ask you another question. Why are people so um, anti-deliverance? Uh, why is there such hostility towards those who, who are in deliverance today? Well, is it, is it a false teaching? Is it is it a cult? Is that what other people are seeing it as? Or? Well, they they say this, and yet they can't produce it. Of course, there are some kooks in the deliverance ministry. There's no doubt about that. And, and some of them I wouldn't let in my church because they're off the wall. They're not following scriptural precepts, principles, or anything else. And uh, they're just going on their own. And, of course, they've done a great deal of damage. But this has happened with evangelism, too. It's happened with every minister healing. You've got quacks moving in every area. So that doesn't necessarily throw a ministry out just because some people are not observing the rules. I think the main thing is, I think the devil has done a, a good work of deceiving and put a heavy deception on the church uh, about this. I know uh, recently... I was dealing with a, a man who used to be a hitman in the Illuminati to kill people who had attacked the Illuminati. And uh, he told me that as a Satan worshiper, one of his jobs, one of his assignments was to infiltrate various churches to ingratiate himself with the members after a time spent several months there and get into a position of favor and then to disseminate false doctrine. And one of the chief false doctrines that he was to plant in these gospel churches these fundamental churches was that a Christian could not have a demon. It was very important to the devil that people not believe that they could have a demon. See, if you cannot get to the root of your problem, there's no way you can ever get help. And with the fundamental churches, see, I come out of a very st a strict fundamental background, and I'm still strict and fundamental, uh, though some people might disagree with me. Uh, my Southern Baptist people would be upset because uh, I believe in the charismatic gifts. And I speak in tongues, baptism, the Holy Spirit. And uh, our charismatic friends would be upset because we cast out demons. But nevertheless, I consider myself very fundamental. And um, there isn't any remedy for many, many of these situations, most of the situations that come up in people's lives. You just mentioned the charismatic movement, and I want to ask you a question in just a moment about that. But first, let me ask you this. You use the term quack. Uh, is there a way of telling whether a deliverance ministry is really on tune or if it is indeed uh, um, a legitimate right, you, deliverance ministry? All right, you can put the scriptural clamps on it. You can put it in the scriptural box. For one thing, are they pushing for money? Is this their big deal? Uh, I don't care whether it's deliverance or whether, what other kind of ministry it is. If they're constant driving for money, drives for money and squeezing money and twisting money at every corner, you better watch out for them. The Bible says that those who lead in God's work are not to be lovers of filthy lucre. I know it takes money to operate, but God has ways of supplying the financial needs of his people. And we have to be very careful of those. You can also look for those who are depending on screaming at the demons at the top of their lungs and going through all kinds of stagey um, presentations to try to arrange to make themselves look like they're super, Superman or something. Uh, that, of course, is out. I mean, uh, in deliverance, the whole body of Christ ministers. At our church, every person is a minister of deliverance. We have 97% workers. The other 3% are in training. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a whole body ministry. And so when you have somebody who is doing it all themselves, 
who doesn't make any effort to teach or to share with others to train them, you better watch out for them. During your deliverance sessions, there's obviously a, an increased uh, decibel level uh, in the noise that's going on. Is it important or, or is it advised that the workers who are working with a person who has a demon uh, yell back? Um, does it become a shouting match? Or <laughs> well, is that noise in, in, one-sided? In one case, it, uh, and uh, some people do it this way, but we feel that's wrong. Our scripture is in quietness and confidence is your strength. We have, when we uh, snag an enemy and he begins to put up a fight, uh, we do exactly like you do with the fish on the line. You don't jerk too hard because he may jump off the hook, but you wait and you let him run and you let him set the hook, but you keep on drawing him in a little closer and a little closer, taking up the slack every time you get a chance. We're dealing with a lot of things we don't quite understand. And uh, the demons do understand their grounds. We're, we're learning. But what little we have learned has caused us to be extremely successful in dealing with a, a great number of demons. And the shouting does not, all it does is make a lot of noise. As a matter of fact, a low, I speak to demons just like I'm speaking now. I refuse to raise my voice and shout at them. I laugh at them a lot. And this enrages them mm -hmm. because uh, one of the things you, a uh, weapon you use on the demons is to get them angry or to get them frightened. Then they make drastic mistakes and this plays right into your hand uh, to get them out. Uh, needless to say, your books are very interesting. There is a tremendous amount of material in here about deliverance and uh, you're quite outspoken in a number of, of things that are going on in, in the country today and I think you have some uh, candid opinions about the charismatic movement itself. Uh, do you think that there's been some, some shortcomings in that movement? Oh yes, I don't think anybody could be honest without facing that. I, uh, <clears throat> I believe the charismatic movement was begun as a great movement of God, but like every other move of God, the enemy has infiltrated and sought to break its back. I'm personally convinced that the charismatic movement, which was a great outpouring of God's Spirit, which saved thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of people in every kind of church, came out of the liturgical churches, out of the fundamental churches, they came out of every kind of body. And he baptized them in the Holy Spirit, gave them gifts. They began to see supernatural healings and manifestations that hadn't been seen on that scale in many, many years. And um, I believe that this was intended by God to be followed by a massive wave of deliverance which was to clean up the people who had been so gifted and so blessed. And it did start. There were leaders leading the, the deliverance movement there for some years. And then all of a sudden, it just, the leaders one by one just sort of went into other things and began to emphasize other things and de-emphasize deliverance. And so for about 11 years, uh, there haven't been too many voices of deliverance myself, Frank Hammonds, and maybe a few others, but most of the voices that were raised in deliverance uh, even 20 years ago are gone from the scene, or at least they're still around, but they're just not saying much about deliverance. And um, the, well, demons, the demons have said that they graduated them to a higher ministry. I don't know how much stock you can put in that, but at any rate, they the, laugh the demons, about it. The demons have told you that during oh, yeah. your deliverance session? Oh, yes, yes. They have, they have, they've laughed about it. They, they wanted to do me the same way, but I, wouldn't, I wasn't interested. What I, what I get from what you're saying is that the demons in one person know what's going on in the spiritual... Uh, oh, yes. What's the oh, word? The demons realm, are, perhaps. Yeah, in the demon network, there's quite network. a communication, yes. There's a, you spoke of the books. I might mention this. Uh, we have a comprehensive cross-reference index, subject index, prepared now to make the books, the information more valuable. So you can zero in on all the information in all five books. The books just came about, you know, we didn't plan to write books. I thought one would be the last, and the second one started as a 15 or 20 page supplement to the first, and then they just went along. The books don't rehash a lot of other material, by the way. They enlarge and modify and increase the information we've gotten on them, but there's no rehashing of material. All the books contain fresh material. And they are, the, the material is actual happenings that you've yes. gone through. Well, I call them workbooks. Workbooks. Yeah, because they're really lab manuals from the church and, and what has happened. And then in the last three years, we've spun out into meetings all across the country and up into Canada and overseas as well. And this has caused the deliverance message to go everywhere. And the, the thrilling thing about the information in the books is 
not that I wrote them because I just compiled it. But uh, the fact is the information works for believers everywhere. They have the same results we have. And this is very gratifying because just believers who never even heard of it can pick up the books if they'll follow the scriptural outlines and use the methods that are described, they'll get the same results. Why aren't more people um, jumping on, I hate to use the word bandwagon, but I'm going to, to, to make my point. Why aren't more people eager to get involved with deliverance? Or maybe they are. Forgive me if they are, but why isn't the charismatic movement now uh, making the big spin towards deliverance now that they're finding out about it? Well, deliverance has always been very unpopular. It causes a commotion. It's um, in Jesus' day and in Paul's day, it caused a lot of trouble. When Paul cast the demon of divination out of that little girl in Acts in the 16th chapter, it caused a riot to break out. Of course, they did it on the streets, and Paul said uh, the demon came out within an hour, which means it took maybe 40, 45 minutes to come out. So it was a spirit of divination. This is one of the answers, too, to people who think it ought to be quickie, just uh, snap, 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 and it's done. Uh, if Paul had difficulty getting a divination spirit out, it's not going to embarrass me if I have a little more trouble than he did. And, um, but uh, it caused riots. The devil is very much against it. it. Demons have testified over and over again all across the country. They've said, uh, you are making a mockery of us. You're putting us to an open shame. You're making people see us, and we don't like that. Now, see, the arguments of the opposition is you should never talk to demons because they'll, they'll lie to you. They'll just see demons always lie. They don't. They said, you're the son of God. We know who you are. That wasn't a lie. They know the truth. They just have to be forced to tell it. And there are ways to do this. When, uh, when you capture, in war, when you capture prisoners of war, you do not discount the uh, testimony of the enemy just because they're enemies and just because they lie. You rather uh, find ways to force them to tell the truth and you check on what they tell you to be sure it's true. And demons have universally testified they don't want to manifest. Their best work is done when they're hidden. When, they're, when nobody knows about them. And uh, so when you expose them and force them to expose themselves, all they expose is their weakness. It doesn't glorify Satan to be exposed because, uh, I mean, a demon crying out, Satan, help me, they're hurting me, or I leave, I'm defeated in the name of Jesus. That doesn't glorify them, and I've heard thousands do that. And that they leave in humiliation and defeat. It's, um, it's God's way of rubbing their nose in the dirt. For those working working in deliverance with with these demons, is is it a dangerous? Um, I mean, physically dangerous thing to be involved with? Should it be reserved reserved for only a few Christians to be involved in, in the deliverance ministry, uh, for fear of becoming injured or uh, um, well, something else such as that? It, should it be reserved for a, for a few experienced people such as yourself, or do you recommend that uh, all churches, the entire congregation, uh, get involved in it? Well. Uh, with me, if you reserve it for a few, that's what's been tried before, and it's never worked. And the reason is it was meant for every believer to be a minister of this. This is the only way we can cope with the demonic problem we have. And yes, there's a danger. There's a danger in getting up in the morning. There's a danger in getting your bathtub. A lot of people break their necks. You know how many people? A thousand people break their necks every year, slip down the bathtub. But you don't stop bathing because of that. You just are cautious. You're careful. Uh, there are a lot of things that's dangerous to get in your car. Did you read the statistics on how many people get killed and maimed and auto accidents? See, we live in danger all the time. We don't stop living because of this. We merely adapt our, we are cautious, we're more thoughtful, and things of this sort. And so the idea that we should not become involved because it's dangerous, well, uh, the, the question is, did Jesus want us to? And it's dangerous. I've been tossed 12 feet across the church by one, and he did it with just backhanding me this way. And most people couldn't throw me that way with two hands. But um, super yeah. supernatural uh, oh, yeah, supernatural. things are happening there. In that but, but there was supernatural help, too. I have a scar over my right eye that uh, got a karate chop from a young Moody Bible Institute preacher. A karate spirit in there did that. He was very angry. He got a hand loose and chopped me on the eye. Should have taken four or five stitches, but Jesus healed it right on the spot. It was never bruised. It was never, it bled a lot, but when I washed the blood off, it was completely healed. Somebody prayed for it to be healed, and 
So we call it first aid on the battlefield. It sounds to me that, that the Ministry of Deliverance is, is not your typical uh, Sunday morning, once uh, one hour per day type ministry. Um, you're talking about uh, physical uh, situations that you found yourself in. Um, why are you why are you still involved in it? Are you starting a third denomination or a fifth denomination? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> the others turned out badly enough. I think we don't need No, we we consider ourselves just doing what the Lord has given us to do. It's doing the works of Jesus and teaching others to do the same thing. Uh, it is uh, we call ourselves very ordinary people. We don't think of ourselves as some something particularly special. Our services run three to five hours usually and uh, we have three of them a week and Sometimes they've even run longer, but we don't consider that too unusual. We read in the Bible, their services ran long also. Uh, I think the thing that's happened, we bobtail the services because nothing was going on. And the, the Bible program in Old and New Testament was to preach the Word of God and then let it be followed by wonders and signs to attest to it. And the only sign around most churches is the one that tells you what the name is. And the, wonder is anybody comes back for the second time because there's not much going on inside, unfortunately. You mean your people are willing to sit and, and uh, do you speak for three hours, no. five hours, or is there something no. else happening in those services? Because that, that <laughs> Pastor Worley, is a long time uh, to be in a building with a, with a few hundred people. It is, it is a long time, and it's an amazing thing. And people, when they tell people they go to church and stay that long, they say, what on earth do you do all that time? Because, see, we don't even have a Sunday school. To That's take my up. next question. Yeah. Uh, what do you do all that time? <laughs> we, well, we just have normal services. We have, uh, we have uh, singing. Then we have test <laughs> You don't believe me. Uh, we have singing. Then we have testimonies in every service. That's a little different. Then we have, I preach for about 45 minutes an hour usually. And then... I give the invitation, then we have kicking, screaming, hollering, and fighting. Now, we don't plan it that way. That's just the way it comes out. The demons just are very reluctant to come out, and so they cause quite a commotion. And we do have a lot of people saved. We have a lot of people healed. We have a lot of people baptized in the Holy Spirit. A lot of people help in other ways, scripturally. But, the, of course, the deliverance is a little spectacular, and that's what people usually remember. However, it's gratifying to know that out of the 1,500 first or more first-time visitors a year who come to this church, and we do have that many, um, they come from everywhere visiting here. The outstanding thing that they all remark about is the love between the people. Because it says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another, and our people do have this. I don't want to belabor the point, but earlier you mentioned that 97% of, of your congregation are workers. I take from that that it's not just the deacons and the elders and, the, and uh, other spiritual heads in the church that are involved in these three to five no. hour services. No, it's all, everybody. When the invitation begins, everybody's involved. Matter of fact, a lot of people are saved in our services, but I don't usually do it down at the front. I do know how to do it. But usually the people win them back in the pews. They'll go to the visitors and meet them after the service dismisses and talk with them. And many times they'll witness to them, lead them to the Lord, and bring them down there and introduce them to me and tell them this is a new brother or sister in the Lord. They do the same thing in the factories and things. We've never had a soul winning course either. I thought, I guess we ought to get around to that. But what we're doing seems to be working well. We, we have no uh, program to get people to bring their Bibles, and yet everybody brings theirs. Uh, we... We have no uh, particular program to promote loyalty to the church, and yet our people are very loyal to the services. Um, no attendance contests and things no, like that? No, we don't have time for that. What, what, do, you, what do you do with <laughs> No, I guess you wouldn't. You can't, we don't even join, we don't even, it's hard to even join the church. You have to let us know ahead of time so you can join early in the service. We don't take members at the close. What, what, do, you do, <laughs> what do you do with children? in a service like that and then with the activity that's going on. You must have a massive uh, nursery staff that, uh, that handles those. No, we have a nursery, but it doesn't have any staff. It's just there for the convenience of those. Uh, the babies and the children are just like they were in the Old New Testament. They're right in the services. Do you allow them to stay around when someone is manifesting and, and you're praying oh, for demons? Yeah, children well, you, are allowed in the same building and in that same oh, yes. area? You could hardly keep them away. They're not afraid. They know what's going on. They'll walk right by where a wild manifestation is going along and have no problem at all. Is there a, an age limit that you set on, on children for praying with, with people? When do, they, when do you start? No, we haven't set any age limit. We've had some very young ones. We have some 10-year-olds that are pretty good at it. And then we have some littler ones that are occasionally come in. And, uh, Let me move away from your 
church services and, and structure itself. Let me ask you a question about idols, something that you refer to in your books um, and in your public speaking. Uh, do people and Christians uh, these day and in this day and age have idols in their homes that uh, perhaps are causing demonic influence in their lives, as referred to in the Old Testament? Yeah. Well, you know, it says in um, Deuteronomy 7:26, I think it is. It says, "Don't bring an abomination into your house, lest you be cursed with the curse that's on it." And we can bring abominable things into our houses. Uh, many of the uh, little uh, Buddhas, for instance. What in the world would a Christian want with a Buddha in there? It's a false religion. Uh, little tiki dolls, uh, carvings, uh, totem poles, souvenirs and things like this from Hawaii, from the Orient, from uh, Mexico, from Latin America. Um, these carved representations of deities from Africa and other places where they worship demons. If you bring these things into your house, you are asking for trouble. But aren't those conversational pieces? Yes, and you'll have lots to talk about if you bring them in there because they will cause all kinds of problems. And we've tra traced many problems of sickness and all kinds of uh, upsets in the home to this sort of thing. Even dolls have caused a lot of trouble. Dolls? Dolls. Um, we just may I, may I ask you to explain that a little, <laughs> little bit? Yeah, that is kind of a big one, isn't it? A uh, strange thing, when you begin to chase out uh, the, the roots of dolls and puppets, you'll find their root back into witchcraft. And uh, it's, it's a relatively recent phenomenon that dolls were allowed for just common people to have. Dolls were only the toys of the witch doctors and were used in witchcraft. And so it's an amazing thing that we're finding out that many of these dolls and things are causing all kinds of trouble in the homes. But, but, but they can, can they cause trouble in a home if that home is, is a Christian home and those people are walking close to the Lord and perhaps a pastor or deacons in the church or, carry or hold respectable positions of leadership? Yeah. Can, can curses and dolls and, and these the types kind of I'm things still about. affect? That's the kind of people I'm talking about. Those are the about. people you're talking about. Yeah, so Not unsafe people who don't believe Lord yes. Jesus Christ is their, right. is their Savior. Right. Uh, these ha can and do cause trouble. Um, uh, for example, uh, one family in our church, the lady had a beautiful geisha doll, one of these beautiful Japanese dolls that had been made with, uh, you know, you've seen the kind under glass, mm -hmm. lovely collector's items, just beautiful things. And her husband began to feel this thing perhaps was evil. So this is described in detail in one of the Annihilating books, but I'll just sketch it in for you. She um, took, a, took a side the um, uh, her husband said she he thought this was evil, so she said let's get rid of it. So they began to disassemble the doll, and they pulled seventy, I believe it was seventy long steel pins out of this doll. All its clothes were pinned on; its body was pinned together, and that that in itself was not so significant. Except as he pulled the pins out with the pliers pains that had been plaguing her in various parts of her body began to leave those parts of her body as he pulled the pins out of there. And she's mm -hmm. been free of them ever since. Of course, they destroyed the doll. A more recent case just came to attention where in Ohio, uh, we got the report that this uh, little girl was having a, seven, a nine year old girl, suddenly developed a bedwetting problem at age seven for two years, and she hadn't had any problem at all. Another strange thing about it, she became nervous, irritable, and very picky about her eating. And for two years this went on, and they noticed though that only when she slept in her own bed did this happen. And her parents became involved in deliverance. They came here to a workshop. They went home excited about deliverance. They'd even tried deliverance before. They'd tried prayer, they'd anointed the house, they'd done everything they knew. Uh, they knew it was demonic. They, and. Uh, so after they came to the workshop, they really decided, well, we're going to find out what's bothering our daughter. This is ridiculous. We don't have to live with this. And they went into her room and just sat there after she'd gone to sleep and just said, Lord, we're going to sit here and wait for you to show us what's wrong. And both of them found their eyes were drawn to a beautiful uh, pair of dolls, a Dutch boy and girl, uh, beautifully made under glass that they had given their daughter two years before. This had been bought by them on their honeymoon 20 years ago 
uh, 20 years before when they had traveled in Europe on their honeymoon. And they had just given her the girl when she was seven, thinking she's old enough now to appreciate them. And that's when the problem began. So they took the, they'd heard the testimony about the dolls, so they took the glass apart and they began to take the dolls apart. And sure enough, I've forgotten the number of pens, 27, 30, something like that. Pens were holding these dolls together. Most of these pens were located in the spinal and the kidney and the abdominal area. And they pulled all these pens out and destroyed the dolls. And from that day on, that child has had no problems. She also, uh, she uh, has had no bedwetting problems at all. And also her finickiness at eating vanished immediately the very next meal after they destroyed this thing. She ate four times her normal eating at a meal. She was very hungry. The irritability, the nervousness, the restlessness had vanished completely. And the child didn't even know anything happened. Only the parents knew. Do you think that was uh, a curse placed on the doll, you know, that affected the child, or, or were there demons in the doll attacking the child, or from, what is their scriptural reference for something like that happening? And we know that demons inhabited uh, people and that also animals, since mm -hmm. Jesus cast the demons into the pigs, but... Well, we, found them in, we found them in things also, because uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the scripture in Deuteronomy 7.26 says that uh, if you bring an abomination in your house, don't bring an abomination in your house, lest you be cursed with the curse that's on it. And for some reason, there was, an, um, there was a curse on these dolls. And when a cursed thing comes in, it gives grounds for the demons to come and be in your house. And particularly, you'll notice that demons try to set you up to get something like that in your bedroom. Be careful about these velvet paintings and things. Sometimes they have curses written on the back of them on a little piece of paper stuck in there. Buddha dolls have been found with little curses rolled up on a tiny little piece of paper and stuck up into holes that were bored in there. You see, many of these things were made by hands dedicated to demons. Uh, in the Old Testament, when they went to make the temple furniture and the things for the tabernacle, uh, the Bible says God gave them cunning skills, the men and women who did the embroidery, who did the fashioning of all these beautiful objects for the temple. Well, the devil does the same thing. He gives cunning skills to those dedicated to him. Well, should you throw out everything that you have? Or, I mean, how do you, you know, whether it's... Some people have almost done not, this. Or what, you know, what, what can you do about that? Or do you tend to get into legalism or fear, you know, of looking at a demon behind every bush or yeah. in every object or whatever? It'd be a good thing to look because <laughs> chances are there are some. Now, seriously, the, there are people who uh, have loaded their house with all kinds of things. And it would be good to take a second look at everything and just see. And if you have an abnormal attachment to something for no particular reason, for instance, owls and frogs carry a tremendous wallop in the occult realm. And uh, you, you don't want to, uh, you, they're creatures of darkness associated with witchcraft. I don't understand really why they cause as much trouble as they do, but they do. And people have gotten rid of them and got rid of their diseases and things a lot of times. And, um, but you go through and you check things out and begin to look at things with a new thing. What, what you do when you find out demons are operating and are maybe against your life or your children, you immediately get on, get on the panic button. That's the wrong place to get. Mm -hmm. Get on the prayer button. Begin to seek the Lord. The demons are no worse now than they were when you didn't know about them. But the difference is you are now moving in a position where you can begin to uh, deal with them rationally and, and work on them. What about the paintings of like the Last Supper and p pictures of Jesus and things like this? Uh, I've heard you speak against them or as, as well as uh, crosses and different emblems like that that are traditional and religious and supposedly very good. What could be the harm in having a picture of Jesus or well, the Last Supper? Uh, some of these religious tokens and gigaws, uh, we've uh, gotten sentimentally attached to them without them having any valid thing. If uh, I'm not, I'm not fond of pictures myself because I think they're, I know they're artist representations. I'm sure they don't look at all like the characters they supposedly pro portray. And uh, as far as some of the other religious things, um, you could read the Babylon, a book like the Babylon Mystery Religion by Robert Woodard and it would clue you in on where a lot of these things come from. You'd be surprised at how many 
of the religious artifacts and so forth that we just accept as always being there have come in from the enemy and have just their little transplants uh, within our f framework. There are spots on our love feast. That's what it amounts to. One last question on this area. Uh, what do you think the scripture means when it talks about graven images? Not having any graven images before you. Are those just the Buddhas and the idols that are created or you know if anything likeness? Well you spoke a moment ago about legalism and we try to be very careful not to put people. You don't want to take people out of one bondage and put them in another. That's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And Christians must learn how to find their answers from the Lord. And one way you do this, you expose a possible evil. Now you go and pray and ask the Father about that in your house and see how, uh, what he says to you. And get people to, it's amazing how quickly Christians will develop and begin to be able to understand what the Lord is saying. They'll read the scripture, they'll seek the Lord directly for help and guidance, and he gives it, because he's anxious to, to do this. You've talked about dolls and uh, frogs and, and what was the other thing you mentioned? Owls. Owls. Um, and, and I know in your books you, you talk about, and in your public speaking as well, talking about curses being passed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just throw that to you. Do you want to make a comment? I'd like you to make a comment on, 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 curses. on curses being passed down from, is it possible for a mother uh, to pass a curse on to a, a child or a great-grandparent? I know you talk about that. I want you to explain that a little bit. <laughs> All right, it's not only possible, but it happens so much until it's so common, until it's almost universal. The reason being because nobody has taken preventative action. Nobody has been able to stop the progression of the enemy. See, you have to realize the demons have had no really effective attack made on them on any broad scale in centuries. Uh, they really, uh, there really hasn't been that much... Uh, trouble given to these, these uh, creatures. And they've had everything going their way and they've got everything infiltrated.